Oh, before we get started this morning, just want to take care of some family business. Back in December, we had to close down here for a couple of weeks. Just a, a, just a ton of illness came through the congregation, and we're at that place again this week. We've got a lot of people out today. A lot of people, some are in serious condition. Uh, some have needed groceries delivered to them. They just can't get out and do anything. And so I wanted us to have a quick word of prayer. You can look around. We're not going to name any names and see who's not here, and, and you know. We've got a lot of people watching from home, from Bedside Assembly. I want to welcome you this morning. A number of our Messianic synagogues had to shut down during the High Holy Days, just COVID running rampant through. And so, Father, we just do thank you today that by your stripes we're healed, Lord. We come against illness today in whatever form it has taken in the lives of our people. In Yeshua's name. We bind the adversary, we bind this illness, Lord, in our people, among our people, within our people. Lord, you came and you died and you rose and paid the price for sin for all generations. Lord, we are a sinful people. But Lord, we pray the resurrection power of Yeshua HaMashiach in our lives on this Shabbat through the airwaves, be healed in Yeshua's name. No plague would come near your dwelling. Remember 40 some years ago when we were meeting in a house in a Messianic synagogue that had just formed in the Rockville, Maryland area and we my family was living in the Northern Virginia area and every Shabbat we would drive an hour across the Potomac River to come to Shabbat services. And we didn't think a thing of it. The cantor who prepared me for Bar Mitzvah in the late 70s, he would be reciting the liturgy with 102 fever. None of us, you know, that was, we were doing what we had to do. Now we want to be cautious here. Listen, if you are feeling ill, please, we provide the live streaming, but we're at the place now in 2021 where we sneeze wrong and we're staying home with what has taken place in this nation and around the world. We're going to have to get a little toughened up. And so we pray resurrection power on those at home right now in Yeshua's name. Special service today to finish off our High Holy Day season, our fall festival season. The Torah of the Lord is perfect. Restoring the soul. The teaching of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. For happy is the man that walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Torah of the Lord, and in his Torah he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by streams of waters that brings forth its fruit in its season and whose leaf does not wither and in whatever he does shall prosper. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when the house of Israel will come to know me and I will put my mitzvot within you and write them in your hearts and I will be your God and you shall be my people and I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, and in love. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. A new heart, a lev chadash, will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my ruach within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my ordinances and do them. For my ordinances which I command you are not too difficult for you, neither are they far off. My laws are not high in the heavens that you should say, who shall go up and bring them down? Neither are they beyond the sea that you should say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring them to us that we may hear them and do them. Behold, my ordinances are near you in your very heart that you may do them. 
Anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who does and teaches what they say will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for one part of a letter of Torah to fail. Do we make void Torah through faith? Not at all. We establish Torah. So then the Torah is holy and the commandment is holy, just and good. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher natan lano hadavar hachai b'mashiach Yeshua Deserving of praise are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word in the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen be amen. If you remain standing, the Matovu is a prayer of our people. And those of you even in your homes recovering, stand with us as well for this prayer. Taken from the Torah, taken from the Psalms as well. As you know, the, the context, starting with the words of Bil'am, Balaam, a prophet sent by Balak actually to curse Israel. But when Balaam saw the people of Israel dwelling in peace and security, God changed his intention of cursing our people. And out of his mouth came these beautiful words of praise. Let's recite them together. Ma tohovu, o halecha yakov, mishkenotecha Yisrael. Oh, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob. Your dwelling places, O Israel. Lord, we love your house and your honor's dwelling place. And we ask you, Lord, would you answer each and every one of us here with Yeshua, with your true and only salvation? We count on that every day, O God. Vashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. You may be seated with your fine selves this morning. Simcha Torah. Welcome to our Simcha Torah service. It means joy of the Torah. Why? Because we bring joy into our lives as we bring Torah into our lives. It is wonderful to rejoice over the Torah. Godly rejoicing, though, is not characterized by excess or frivolity, but by sanctified, profound, and deep joy. It's based on the firm understanding that Adonai is the sovereign creator and controller of the universe. The Psalms speak of the Torah as we read in the highest of terms. And since God gave it to Israel, even some would say that it has defined and maintained the Jewish people. A Jewish saying suggests that even more than, the Torah, than Israel kept the Torah, the Torah kept Israel. And so this celebration emerged sometime around between 200 and 600 CE or AD in Babylon as the rabbis were codifying the oral law and reformulating Judaism without a temple. It really became popular in Jewish communities in the diaspora sometime after the 11th century of this era. In Israel, Simchat Torah is celebrated on the same day as Shemini Atzeret, the final day of the Feast of Sukkot, which According to the scriptures, we learned last Shabbat is a Mikra Kodesh, is a holy convocation. And so it was not, Simchat Torah was not a full-blown festival in biblical days, yet Adonai did mandate that Israel was to take special times to put the Torah on center stage. A number of times in the history of our people, public readings of the Torah actually served as a catalyst to profound spiritual revival. Let's place ourselves back just for a few minutes here, 2,450 years ago to this particular day on the biblical calendar in the scriptures and see what took place back then. Open with me to Nehemiah chapter 9 for a moment and let's begin reading in verse 1. Now on the 24th day of the same month, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads, and the offspring of Israel separated themselves 
from all foreigners standing and confessing their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. They stood in their place and read in the scroll of the Torah of Adonai their God for a quarter of the day. Isn't that interesting? We can't even go an hour and people are already getting spilkas and needing to leave. But, and for another quarter they were confessing and prostrating themselves before Adonai their God. Verse 5, the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabinea, Sherbiah, Hodaya, Shabania, and Pathan. Ahia said, stand up, bless Adonai your God from everlasting to everlasting. May your glorious name be blessed. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are Adonai. You made the heavens, even the highest heaven with all its array, the earth and everything on it, the seas and everything in them. You gave life to them all and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Verse 13, you descended on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just judgments, reliable laws, and good statutes and mitzvot. You made known to them your holy Shabbat and ordained for them mitzvot, statutes, and Torah by the hand of your servant Moses. Verse 18. Even when they made a cast image of a calf for themselves and said, This is your God who brought you up from Egypt. Or when they committed great blasphemies. Yet in your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud by day did not depart from above them, guiding them in the way, nor the pillar of fire by night, illuminating the way they should go. You also gave your good ruach, your spirit, to teach them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouth, and you gave them water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their garments did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Verse 26, nonetheless, they became contentious and rebelled against you. They cast your Torah behind their back. They killed your prophets who warned them to return to you. They committed appalling blasphemies. Therefore you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. But in the time of their distress, they cried out to you and you heard from heaven. According to your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them out of the hand of their enemies. Verse 33. You are righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have acted faithfully while we have done wickedly. Our kings and our leaders, our kohanim, our priests and our ancestors have not kept your Torah or paid attention to your mitzvot or your testimonies by which you have admonished them. Verse 1, chapter 10. Now because of all this, we are making a binding agreement in writing. And the names of our leaders, our Levites and our priests are affixing their seals on the document, verse 30, to join their brothers, the nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in the Torah of God, given through Moses, the servant of God, and to keep and do all the mitzvot, the commandments of Adonai, our Lord, along with his ordinances and his statutes. What a day in the life of our people. 2,450 years ago and how far we've strayed from where these guys were at in terms of making a covenant back with the Lord. And so some well-meaning believers would see a service like this and see the prominent place that Messianic synagogues give their Torah scrolls during every Shabbat service and especially on this day. And, and they've kind of thrown a little pot shots at us claiming bibliolatry, meaning worship of a scroll. And we understand their concern. We're not worshiping objects. We're not worshiping icons. We're not worshiping a scroll. And they seem to miss the point of our celebration by a, a mile. Now the object itself, as we're going to look at a little bit later, the scroll made of parchment, written with ink letters, indeed has much value for sure. But what makes it exceedingly special is the fact that it is the Word of God. Is it possible to separate God from God's word? Absolutely not. God's word, whether it's written, whether it's spoken, still accomplishes his will. 
And so when we celebrate Simchat Torah today, we're actually verbalizing to the Lord, Abba, we are grateful for your word. There's a story from the Shoah, the Holocaust, which applies to this day, and it goes like this. A group of Jewish boys, true story, under the age of 18, were scheduled for the gas chambers in Auschwitz. And as they walked into the chambers, they knew what fate awaited them. It was late in the war, and they had heard of many horrible atrocities being committed against their people. And as the doors of the, of the chamber closed, one boy sprang up and shouted, Brothers, today is the holiday of Simcha Torah, when the Jewish world rejoices. Having concluded the reading of the Torah over the past year, followed directly with the commandment of the new cycle of the Torah reading. And the boy went on to say, during our short lives, we have tried to uphold the Torah to the best of our ability. And now we have one last chance to do so. Before we die, let us celebrate Simcha Torah one last time. We do not possess anything anymore, the boy continued. We have nothing. We don't have clothes to cover us. We don't have a, a Torah scroll, a Sefer Torah which, with which to dance. So let us dance with God himself who is surely here among us before we return our souls to him. The chamber rafters began to tremble with the pure, sweet strains of 50 young voices raised in fervent song. Never before had its concrete floor shaken under the pounding of 50 pairs of feet stamping in unbridled joy. The boys pierced the heavens with their song, Ashrenu Matov Chelkenu Uman Naim. How fortunate are we, it means, and how wonderful is our portion, and how beautiful is our heritage. Upon hearing all this, the camp commandant was summoned to the doors of the gas chamber. He listened with growing fury to the incongruous revelry inside. He had watched Jews marching to their death hundreds of times before, some weeping softly, others reciting prayers, and he had relished those scenes. But this, this singing and dancing, this was unacceptable. He flung open the gas chamber doors, pulled one boy toward him. You, he shouted, tell me why you are singing and dancing now. Because leaving a world where Nazi beasts reign is cause for celebration, the boy replied. And because we are overjoyed at the prospect of reuniting with our beloved parents, whom you murdered so viciously. The commandant became enraged at the boy's contemptuous words. The commandant ordered the guards to remove the boys from the gas chamber. He planned to begin torture sessions the following day. But the next morning, a high-ranking Nazi officer traveled to Auschwitz to round up slave labor. And as he strode through the camp looking for prospects, the Nazi officer just happened to pass by the barracks in which the 50 religious boys had been temporarily housed. Their vitality undiminished by their overnight stay, the boy still radiated strength and good health. The Nazi officer pulled rank on the camp commandant who revealed nothing about his original plans for the boy's fate. He stood silently as the Nazi officer ordered the boys and several hundred other inmates to board the tracks that rolled out of Auschwitz into safer climbs. It is said that the boys left the ground singing Survivors of Auschwitz report that all 50 boys survived the war. There's a story on the Chabad website entitled Dancing with God. And with that in our hearts and in our minds, let's celebrate God today as we worship Him.
Jerusalem To the winding hills of Tennessee With one voice let's worship Him The God of all lands I am
you'd remain standing as we open up the ark of the Lord today and we process his word through the congregation. We're excited to hear from the Lord this morning. Please join me as we open the ark. Vea futsu ho hi vecha, vea nusu mi sanecha, mi panecha. Ki mi tzion te tzetora, ki mi tzion Tate hey Torah, O Devar Adonai, me Yerusha Lahaim, Baruch Shenatan, Torah Torah, Baruch Shenatan. Torah, Torah, Le Amo Yisrael, Behik Dusha
the Shema is an anthem of our people. It is our pledge of allegiance to our one God, an affirmation of our Judaism as well. And so if you'd remain standing as we recite our response to God as God is speaking to us, our response back to him, let's recite these words from Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 and forward together. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Boruch Shem Kevod Mahalchuto Leolam Vahaim. Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious Malchut, his kingdom, which is forever. And ever. Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem Adonai. You may be seated. Our kids are probably already at their classes if we have any kids today. I tell you, we have been, whew, it's a rough day today. Rough day today. We do. Okay, great. I'm going to ask Bob and John if you would come forward. Maybe somebody can get John if he's running security. Appreciate that. We want to undress the Torah this morning. If I can get both those guys, Bob and John, from outside. <laughs> While they're doing that. There we go. All right. get John too. Yeah. All right. It's on his way. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
As we undress the Torah this morning, I'm going to ask you, if, once they get that set up, to come on forward. going just to unroll the scroll and leave it there for a few minutes. We're going to ask you in a moment to come forward. Once a year, I wanted to give some explanation. If you'd all would come forward at this point and kind of gather around the, the bema concerning some aspects of our Torah scroll. This Torah scroll, all of them actually are written by specialists known as a sofer, a scribe. Uh, they maintain tools and materials including parchment as you see there, a uh, quill of a turkey feather, some ink, a stylus, and a ruler, and a book of the Torah text. We see here the Torah is written on parchment manufactured from specific sections of hides of kosher animals. Nowadays, the skins are softened by soaking them in clear water for two days, and then after which they remove the hair of the animal, and then they soak the hides in lime water for another nine days. And finally, the skins are rinsed off, and then they're dried, and the creases are ironed out by large presses. And you can see on ours the ink must be black, and to ensure that the letters will be written straight, the lines will be equally spaced. There are 43 thin lines drawn across the width of the parchment with a stylus and a ruler. Two additional longitudinal lines are drawn at the end of each page to ensure that all lines are, equally, are equal at the same place, they end at the same place. A four-inch margin you can see on the bottom, three inches of margin on top, two inch margin between the columns enhances the appearance of the printing on the parchment. And so from the beginning of around the 19th century, a standard pattern arose of 248 columns of letters of 42 lines each was established. Now to avoid mistakes that Talmudic scribes may have copied from maybe another scroll, according to one tradition there was a copy of the Torah in the temple which scribes used as the standard. And so before they commenced, the scribe would test the feather and the ink out. He would write the name Amalek, and then he would cross the name out, according to Deuteronomy 25, 19. Now we know Hebrew is written from right to left, but each individual letter here in the Sefer Torah is written from left to right. That's difficult. There's a nine-letter space gap. Oh, that's huge, right? Between parashiot, between portions. And a four-line separation is made between each of the five books of Moses, which is much easier to delineate. As you take a look at some of the letters there, you can gather close in there, seven of these 22 Hebrew letters of the alphabet have a special design on the upper left-hand corner of the letter, shaped somewhat like the Hebrew letter Zion. By the way, we have Hebrew classes following our service every week at 1230, led by our Israeli teacher, Shuli. If you can't make those classes on Saturday afternoons, uh, she will begin this Tuesday evening at our sister congregation, Kehilat Ariel. I believe that's at 7 o'clock for the next 11 Tuesday nights. You can join her up there as well. The Torah, as you see, contains, for those men in the Hebrew classes, no vowels, no punctuation marks, no cantillation marks, and if it does, if you see that, it's unfit for use. A scroll is unfit for use if even one letter is omitted. And so after the copying is complete and has been completed, the sheets of the parchment are sewn together with a specific thread known as the gidin made of tendon tissue. Uh, Dad was, as we were rolling it before the service to the place where we wanted it today, he noticed that that thread was there on every four sheets. It's, made of ten, it's uh, taken from the foot muscles of a kosher animal, this tendon tissue. So every four of these pages are sewn together on the outer side of the parchment 
to form a section. And after connecting the sections of each of these four sheets, the end sheets are then tied, as you see, to wooden rollers, each of which is termed Etz Chaim, Tree of Life. Each Etz Chaim sent, consists, as you see, of a center pole, handles, on the wood, uh, handles of wood, flat circular rollers to support the weight of this rolled up scroll. And besides uh, serving as a means of rolling the scroll, the Azechaim, the Trees of Life, also prevent people from touching the parchment with their hands. In some Sephardic synagogues or some Oriental synagogues, the flat rollers are not employed since the Torah scrolls are kept in a different case, in a metal case or an ornamental wooden case. Now, mistakes in the Torah scroll can generally be corrected. Uh, maybe you've written some notes in your Bible and you're wondering, well, how do I correct that? Well, you can here. The ink can be erased with a knife and pumice stone. But a mistake in the names of the writing of the name of God cannot be corrected since the name of God may not be erased, right? Such faulty parchments need to be discarded. And so if a scroll is beyond repair, it's placed in an earthenware urn and buried in the cemetery. It's customary to bury such scrolls alongside the resting place of a prominent rabbi. Maybe I'll make some space for myself and wherever my plot will go for this one, I don't know. I'm planning to be here a while, though, Lord willing. But the Sefer Torah is the most sacred of all of our Jewish books and must be treated with special sanctity and great reverence. We should not touch the bare parchment if we can with the hand. And for this reason, uh, the yad, the literal the hand, the pointer, is used for reading. It's quite literally, as you see, a hand <laughs> with a pointing finger. And so when the Torah scroll is transferred to a permanent location... It's carried through the streets under a canopy, and a procession goes along with that with song and dance. We did this. We did it 16 years ago as we moved into a building that was actually constructed as a conservative synagogue on 69th Street, and that was a joyous day, and I remember that day well. Uh, we had police escort. One of our guys worked as a, a, cha a chief for the Veterans Administration, and we had Joel Chernoff in concert. It was just a great day. But you'll find on the Sifre Torot, the Torah scrolls, mounted on each its chayim, uh, I don't know what, if we left them in the ark or not, but two finials call, called rimonim. We can uh, hold those up, Craig, if you would. would. Uh, these have developed, may have developed from decorated knobs on the top of ancient trees of life. You also can find an open crown. I know you probably got that somewhere around here. Uh, the surrounding both finials on top of the scrolls in order to emphasize the metaphor Keter Torah, the crown of the Torah, found on our decorative velvet mantle. And we have that silver Keter Torah as well. We then have the velvet breastplate or the shield, uh, which originally hung from the trees of life to designate the various scrolls that would be read on various occasions throughout the year. It is called the breastplate to recall the what? The breastplate worn by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. So after the Torah reading, the scrolls rolled together on its Azechayim, and it's kept tight by a long velvet wide ribbon. The mantle is made of silk or velvet. Uh, it's protective, it's beautiful, and it developed in obedience to the admonition, the Talmudic admonition, quote, have a beautiful scroll of the, of the law prepared, copied by an able scribe with fine ink and wrapped in beautiful silk. So our Torah mantle is a sheath. It's open at the bottom, closed at the top, except for the two circular openings at the top through which both uh, Azechayim protrude from it. So the command was to assemble the people at the end of every seven years at the Feast of Sukkot, at the end of Sukkot, during it, to read the entire Torah. It's the earliest reference we have to a public reading of the Torah. A second mention is uh, we find in the book of Ezra as well, when he read the Torah, as we've talked about over these last several weeks to all the people, both men and women, from early morning until midday on the first day of the seventh month. And so this custom of reading the Torah actually dates way back to about the first half of the third century BC, since the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Tanakh, was compiled for this purpose of public reading in the synagogue. Josephus refers to public Torah readings as well as an ancient practice. And so this contention is supported by evidence throughout the New Covenant, where we find in Acts 15 where it says, From the earliest times, Moses had 
has in every city those who proclaim him with his words being read in the synagogues every Shabbat. And so the practice of completing the Torah reading with a passage from one of the prophetic books, the Haftorah, the completion, it's mentioned in the Mishnah as well, Megillat 4, 1 and 2. But the origins of that custom of reading the prophetic portion are obscure. But the customs referred to in the New Covenant period and the particular chosen prophetic passage went along with the day's Torah reading. And so I'm going to have John and Bob begin to re-roll it. It's at the end of Deuteronomy where we finished last week, and we're going to have them re-roll it back. You can be seated, and we're going to have them roll it back to Bereshit 1.1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where we're going to pick up a little bit later. But according to tradition, again, the custom of reading through the entire Torah on a weekly basis was instituted by Ezra in the 5th century BCE when he faced, he was faced with a monumental task of rebuilding Jewish civilization upon the return back from Babylon. Now, originally it seemed that Israeli Jews developed a triennial cycle of th every three years of reading through it, but um, the Torah was divided at that point into 154 portions and was read over a period of three years. But Babylonian Jewry, in, as we suffered in exile, we developed an annual reading cycle in which the Torah was completed in one year, beginning and ending today on Simcha Torah. And so this became the actual standard practice of our people for all over the world. By the first century of this era, Luke 4.17 tells us that the Torah and the prophets were publicly read every Shabbat in the synagogue, and actually Shaul's, Paul's instruction to his mentee Timothy, he wrote this, quote, pay attention to the public reading of the scriptures. And it points to this. They didn't have the new covenant scriptures written by that point, or m most of it anyway. And so I rejoice, and I think you can rejoice, and we can all rejoice at the fact that so many messianic believers over the past 25 to 30 years have return to a pattern of weekly Torah examination. The psalmist says, quote, Those who love your Torah have great peace. Nothing makes them stumble. And likewise, Shaul spoke of the person who says, quote, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. So it's been a useful practice for a good swath of the Messianic movement to examine the weekly parashah, the portion on a consistent basis, not unlike the rest of the traditional Jewish world. And we did this for many years with the Torah class following our main service with our qualified teachers over many years. At the same time, we still have these words, though, from Yeshua, who said this, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. So I believe we as Messianics have done a pretty good job. We've done our best to see Yeshua in the Torah of Moses. But what about seeing him in the prophets? What about seeing him in the Psalms, in the writings? And for that matter, what about in the New Covenant Scriptures as well? What about those Scriptures? Well, if you've been around here for any length of time, and many of you have, especially over the past, I don't know, 15 years or so, we've systematically led us through a good portion of Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. In the Tanakh, for 14 months in late 2006 through early 2008, we studied some of the Nevi'im Rishonim, the early prophets, First and Second Kings. Beginning in November of 2009, we embarked on a nearly two-year extended study of Shnaim Asar, the 12 that are included in the Nevi'im Achronim, the latter prophets, for the majority of 2008, the first half of 2012, and for the 11 months in 2015, we studied some of the Kituvim, the writings, Song of Songs, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah. For 15 months in 2019 and 20, we studied the books of Shmuel, Samuel. And in the New Covenant, the Brit Chadashah, we spent a year studying the gospel according to Yochanan. 2005, 2006. We spent over a year in Ma'aseh HaShlechim, 
the Acts of the Emissaries back in 2008 and 9. We studied various New Covenant letters in a midweek scripture study we had between 2008 and 2010. We studied the Gospel of Mark for 15 months in 2012 and 2013. We studied Shaul's letters to Philemon, Titus and Timothy in the first half of 2014, and his letters to the Colossians and Thessalonicans in the last half of 2016. We took seven months in 2017 and 2018 studying through the book of Revelation. We took eight months in 2017 and 2018 studying Shaul's letter to the Romans. And we are currently in an extended study, probably our longest study in the gospel according to Luke, which we began in May of 2020, which we will continue in next Shabbat, probably will go through early February. My friends, the Holy Scriptures, the point is, are a treasure trove of revelation and insight from our Heavenly Father. Amen? As important as the Torah is and has been to many of us these past few years of rediscovery and learning all throughout the Messianic world, let us not forget it is but the first part of God's continual plan of salvation. An important part, yes, but it's not the only part. As you know, Scripture builds upon itself, and the five sections of our Bible reveal a unique quality that we should be considering if we are to be well-rounded believers. The Torah is the foundation. The Nevi'im, the prophets, are the exhortation. The writings and the wisdom literature are the motivation. The Gospels are salvation. And the apostolic letters are application. So today, we complete our annual reading cycle. And with hardly even a, a breath, we are to begin it again with Genesis 1, verse 1. Today, we have read of the death of Moses, and we will continue now with the birth of humanity again. Today, as we've come from the rolling, we... We've read of the failure of Moses at the end of the scroll to enter the promised land. And we return now to read of the first humans planted in the Garden of Eden. And in this fashion, the Torah appears as a continuum of creation, of completion, of death and of life, of success and of failure. Its cycle mirrors the cycle of our lives, doesn't it? And so even in its last line in Deuteronomy... There's no punctuation mark at the end like a period. Just half a line left blank that leads and brings us back to Bereshit bara Elohim. Traditionally, we say chazak, chazak, venit chazek. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened at the conclusion of the reading. Baruchu et Adonai Hamvorach, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vahind, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vahind, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Asher bachar banu mikol ha'amim, v'natan lanu et torato, baruch ata Adonai, noten ha-torah. Amen. We pick up the reading in the first portion this morning of Scripture. If you would turn with me uh, to Genesis chapter 2. And we want to begin reading in verse 18. Vayomer Adonai Elohim, lotov heyot ha'adam, ha'adam levado, e'ese lo ezer k'negdo. Then Adonai Elohim said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Let me make a well-matched helper for him. Vayitzer Adonai Elohim min ha'adama kol chayat, hasadev et kol of hashemayim, vayave el ha'adam 
לראות מה יקרה לו, וכל אשר יקרא לו, האדם נפש, חיה הוא שמו. אדוני אלוהים had formed from the ground every animal of the field and every flying creature of the sky, so he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called them, each living creature, that was its name. ויקרא האדם שמות לכל, הבהמה ולעוף השמיים, ולכל חיית השדה ולאדם לא מצא עזר כנגו. You guys can just hold off for a minute there for a few minutes. So the man gave names to all the livestock and to the flying creatures of the sky and to all the animals of the field. But for the man, he did not find a well-matched helper for him. Problem. Vayapel Adonai Elohim. Tardema al ha'adam. Vayishan vayikach achat. Mitzal otav vayisgot basar tachtena. Adonai Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs. My friend Dr. Raleigh Washington said, loves to say one of his prime ribs. And closed up the flesh in its place. Vayiven Adonai Elohim et ha-tzela asher lakach. מהאדם לאישה, ויביא אה אל האדם. אדוני אלוהים built the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman. Then he brought her, her to the man. ויאמר האדם זאת הפעם, אצם מעצמי ובשר מבשרי לזאת. יקרא אישה כי מאיש Then the man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one is called woman. And from this, for from man was taken this one. Alken ya'azof ish et aviv ve'et imo ve'davak bi'ishto This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. Vayihiyu shnaihem arumim ha'adam v'ishtovelo yit boshashu. Now both of them were naked. The man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Asher natan lanu Torah temet, Vechaye olam nata betochenu, Baruch atah Adonai, Noten ha-Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, who gives the Torah. Amen. We're going to get back to that reading in Genesis 2 in a moment. But how many of you believe that God wants, even desires, his children to prosper? Anybody believe that? <laughs> A few of you? All right. Third Yochanan, verse 2 says, it says this, loved ones, I pray that all may go well with you, that you may be in good Bruce, health. That's our prayer today for those people that couldn't be with us. Just as it is well with your soul. Another translation of that verse says this. Dearly loved one, I pray that you may in all respects prosper and keep well. 
Another translation says, Dear friends, I pray that all may be well with you and that you may have good health. Now, some people will say, well, that's not talking about financial prospering. Now, the Greek word here translated prosper is you do, which means a good road or a good journey. At the very least, then, Yeshua's emissary, John, is wishing Gaius here, who is writing a good and prosperous journey. But nobody can have a good journey or prosperous journey if, if one, he or she is lacking. If he or she is in poverty, in want, every step of the way, common sense no tells us that the wish for someone to have a prosperous journey includes his or her having enough resources to travel on that journey prosper, prosperously, safely, comfortably, right? And besides, the word here translated prosper is the same Greek word Shaul used in another place in 1 Corinthians 16 too, where he instructed believers to set aside some money each week on Motza is Shabbat, the going out of the Sabbath, Saturday night, as God has prospered him. So the word prosper can certainly without doubt be used and is used in reference to financial prospering. God desires his children to prosper materially, physically, and spiritually. Amen. Now many of us struggle with the limitations of poverty with, and lack until we learn that God indeed desires us to prosper, in the words of Isaiah, to eat the good of the land. You see, learning, God wants us to have all the information and to have all the knowledge that we need in these areas of our lives. He said through the prophet Jeremiah, call out to me and I will what? Answer you. I will tell you great things, hidden things of which you're not aware. You see, we need to discover that God's promise for us is to thrive and to flourish in every aspect of our being. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, materially, and financially. The key to doing that is to bless others when we have that opportunity. And guess what? We have an opportunity right now. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. You have an offering envelope in your seat in front of you. You can take that out. If you want a tax-deductible receipt at the end of uh, 2021, you can fill out that information, and we will properly allocate it uh, in, in the records to give you that at the end of the year. God wants us to prosper, to be a blessing, to be able to give to others in time of need. I want to thank publicly Barbara Lukens, who went out yesterday. I gave her a text message. I said, listen, we've got a very sick person in your area. We've got a lot of sick people, but one in your area. Would you go shopping for her? Because she can't leave her house. And she just did it right then and there. Just and we offer that to anybody online as well. If you can't get out, if you're quarantining, just let us know. We'll get somebody out there and we'll, we'll shop for you. We'll do what we need to do. Abba, we thank you and we bless you today for your word. Call out to you, Lord, and we want to have all the information. We want to have all the knowledge. Maybe tradition has got in the way of, of true biblical truth. So we want to put aside that tradition, Lord. We know you want us to prosper in every area of our lives. Thank you that we can be a blessing here amongst us, amongst Mishbucha, O oh God. For truly many are in need, even at this time. We lift up our families to you right now, those who are here, those who could not be here. Again, we pray the resurrection power of Yeshua goes in and through their bodies to restore them to perfect health. They'll be back a week from now. We love you and we bless you, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Oh, man. If this is your first time, don't know if we have anybody, raise your hand. I want to put a free book into your hand as well. That will give you an idea who we are, what we do, what our vision is, how we do it in this messianic movement. And with that, I'm going to ask our worship team to come back uh, to the platform. You can take a look in your bulletins as well for all the items coming up. Women's prayer will be starting on the 14th, Thursday night from 7 to 8 at 8 p.m. at Regina Cooper's house. The address is on your app. Take a look at your app for all the instructions and locations. Uh, you can take a look at all of those in the app as well as the printed bulletin when you came in. Let's continue worshiping this morning. Stand and let's just worship and thank our Father. We know that every word that he has spoken is true. Amen. <clears throat> Walking around these walls And I thought by now they'd fall But you have never
I'll see you do it again. 
seated today. Thank you so much, team. So excited when I hear reports of what God is doing in and through each one of you. I was looking before the service at some photos of Craig. Craig got a, has been having opportunities to preach before thousands in Pakistan and to see the different healings that were manifested and things. It just all it takes is for us to say, Hineni shlachani, here am I, Lord, send me. And our sisters and our brothers are getting opportunities to share the good news in Mexico and in other congregations. And it's just a great thing because we're not sitting in a pew or a chair. We're actually being deployed for the Lord because all we've said is, Lord, here we are. Use us. And God's using you here as well. We cannot do this without you. Listen, if those two, three, four guys don't show up, we got nothing. I got no microphone. We're not streaming. We're not doing anything. Each one of us, if, if Jeff's not watching the door, who knows what's coming through this door? And I appreciate him watching the doors and, and so many others that are doing so many good works for the kingdom. Well, open up where we left off in better sheet. A couple of announcements. Many of you saw the president this week take his booster shot. And he was asked... During that time of taking that booster, what percentage of Americans must get vaccinated before life returns, normal life? And out of his mouth, he said as much as 98% of the country. It certainly can't be 75%, he said. He said, one thing is certain, quote, a quarter of the country can't go unvaccinated and us not continue to have a problem. There's the plan, folks. If you feel the noose is tightening around your neck occupationally and where you're going to send your kids to school, I'm telling you, we are in some trying times. I thought I was writing a lot of letters for your employers, and now it looks like I'm going to be writing a lot of letters for your children, too. But we'll continue to do that and fight the good fight and do what we can and contact our representatives, express our displeasure on this mandate. This is a large portion of scripture, and so 
what's the, what's the portion of the portion that's going to speak to our people here today? Well, it's interesting as we re-rolled the scroll today that Clement of Rome, who was actually a disciple of Shimon Kepha, Peter, he advised the believers in Corinth to consider how they would lay hold of the blessings of God. His letter to the Corinthians is not part of the New Covenant, but it provides an important glimpse into the first century believers. Clement told them this, quote, Let us unroll the things which have taken place from the beginning. What does he mean when he wrote unroll the things? He's referring to the scroll of the Torah. You see, when we unroll a Torah scroll, the first thing we read is the stories that, quote, have taken place from the beginning. The first book of our Torah scroll is Genesis. Its Hebrew name is Bereshit, which means in the beginning. Clement told us, he tells us to unroll the scroll of the Torah and consider the things that have taken place since the beginning of in the beginning. Therefore, Peter's disciple, Clement, advises us to study the Torah in order to take hold of God's blessings in our lives. And so since Torah study, really all scriptures included in that, is a commandment and a spiritual undertaking, it's customary in Israel to first pray and bless Adonai before reading. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to engage in study of the words of Torah. So we want to focus once again on a particular portion of this portion, on the first half of it in particular, matters surrounding that we read in Hebrew, Adam and Eve. How many of you know, my friends, marriage is a grand theme of all of Scripture? Yet did you know this, that half of all marriage today will fail even though 85% of all marriage ceremonies take place in a congregation. Most marriages are not happy marriages. Marriages between Yeshua followers are not, exception, not exceptions to that rule. In fact, believing couples tend to have higher expectations of marriage than their secular neighbors. And higher expectations, how many of you know, often lead to even deeper disappointments. The number of unmarried couples has soared 17-fold from 430,000 in 1960 to over 7.5 million today. And as a consequence, the percentage of adults who are married fell during that same period from 72% to 57%. Most younger Americans will spend time today living together outside of marriage. An unmarried cohabitation commonly precedes marriage. Now, unfortunately, for couples who live together before marriage, many will never marry, and 75% of those who marry who are cohabiting before marriage will end in divorce. There have been 46 million divorces since 1970, shattering the lives of 44 million children. One quarter of all adults ages 18 to 35 have grown up in a divorced family. In only 10% of second marriages do both partners reconstruct happier lives, even 10 years after divorce. The United States has both the highest congregational membership and attendance rate, but also the highest divorce rate in the world. The good news is that 80% of marriages in crisis, or maybe not in crisis, but having severe difficulties, can be restored. Yeah. That's good news. Genesis 2.18, where we read earlier, states this, Then Adonai Elohim said, It is not good for the man, Adam, humankind, to be alone. Let me make a well-matched helper for him. In the previous chapter, chapter 1, God declared everything that he created to be tov, right? Good. The only thing in creation that Adonai declared to be not good was man being lonely. 
man experienced an inconsolable loneliness. He sought a partner, and that's the way God made men. The Almighty hardwired the desire for love and companionship into us as human beings. Let me also say that the single life is only for a select few to whom it has been given. Matthew chapter 19 verse 12 talks about this very quickly. Where Yeshua said, For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made that way by men. And there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who can accept this, let him accept it. Those who have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven is the man who voluntarily chooses a life of celibacy. He chooses to remain single. Why? So that he could serve Adonai with an undivided heart and undivided attention. The Bible presents the single life as a viable option for those select individuals whom Adonai has specifically called to that purpose. But as a general rule, it is not good for a man to be alone. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, oftentimes a single man does not serve God. He serves himself. The married man learns, hopefully he learns, to serve God by serving his wife. And as he serves his wife, he serves God. This is one reason it's not good for man to be alone. Except for Shaul, Paul, and Yochanan, John. So far as we know, all of the shalachim, all the emissaries, had wives. So let's read on. In Genesis chapter 2, we find in... Verse 20, but for the man, he did not find a well-matched helper for him. Verse 21, Adonai Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man and he slept. And he took one of his, Adam, humankind, one of his ribs, his selah, his side, and closed up the flesh in its place. Interestingly enough, the third century CE rabbi Samuel ben Narchom said God created Adam, humankind, facing both ways. Then he sawed them in two and made backs for each figure. That's an interesting thought. Verse 22 Adonai Elohim built the rib, built the selah, built the side, which he had taken from Adam, the man, into a woman. Then he brought her to the man. Then the man, Adam, said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh from my flesh. This one is called woman, Isha, for from Ish, from man, was taken this one. This is why a man, an Ish, leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. Like the polar opposites of a magnet, the soul of a man draws the soul of a woman And the soul of a woman draws the soul of a man. One flesh is one body. Therefore, the bride of Adam is the body of Adam. And the bride of the Messiah is called the body of the Messiah. My friends, marriage is so important. In fact, the marriage relationship, biblically, supersedes that of the parent and the child relationship. Why? Because the husband and wife cleave. What does that mean? Join, stick, uh, unite. My friends, marriage is the uniting of a man and a woman to create something new, something unique, a relationship wherein two people each relinquish self for the sake of fulfilling the other. Oh, that's heavy. It is two individual souls fused together in love, yet maintaining their individual identities. Two becoming one. By giving, not taking. Now you can have this marriage, this kind of marriage with your spouse that you're married to right now. If if you stop waiting for them to change... And start doing the work that only you can do or that only I can do. 
It's been said that marriage is an adventure, like going to war. See, a G.K. Chesterton said. It's true. All marriage involves warfare. You may, however, in your marriage, been fighting the wrong enemy. Hmm. Your battle is not with your spouse. It's not between you and your spouse. We must make ourselves vulnerable. The problem in your marriage is you. It's me. Change you, change me, and you change your marriage. If you don't like your spouse's attitude, adjust your own. You can't defeat your enemy without defeating your own ego. My friends, in this battle, your spouse is your ally. They're not our enemies. Men, come on. Trying to change your spouse will only create walls between you. It will inflict pain and scarring and will take years to heal up. And maybe it will even destroy your marriage. That's a foundational principle that we need to lay hold of, my friends. We cannot change our spouse. I've tried. To the same proportion that a marriage has the potential to bring a blessing, to bring goodness, to bring selfless love, to bring spiritual unity, to bring fulfillment. However, it also has the potential to bring pain, Ooh. misery, and pressure in every area of a person's life. You can change only you. Did you know that marriage is God's testing ground? Primarily his testing ground, his primary testing ground of faith and spiritual growth. Every single Tuesday night we have prayer. John Neal always reminds us of that. We're praying for the world. We're praying for the government. We're praying, all these things which we need to pray for. And John always brings us back to how we treat our spouse. Every Thursday, Tuesday night. For you see, a man or woman can maintain a pretense, and we do, in front of people who do not live with him or her. I look great to you every Shabbat, don't I? But man, if you followed me with a hidden camera in my house, it's not pretty all the time. She'll tell you. I messed up even this morning. I took the wrong colored towel. That's like a capital offense. I need to be shot. Really, it was her towel. Didn't have my glasses on, couldn't see. It's a little, one's a bluer, one's a little grayer. But I'm telling you, it's not pretty all the time. But, and perhaps that we appear to be full of the fruit of the Spirit. We appear here on Shabbat full of love, full of joy, full of peace, full of patience, full of kindness, full of goodness, full of self-control. A married person, however, can't fool his or her spouse. Marriage will test your character. I'm not looking at her when I'm preaching this message. Though. But the way that we treat or mistreat our spouse and the way we react when our spouse mistreats us reveals our inner person, doesn't it? Our devotion, your devotion to Yeshua is all theoretical until God tests it in the crucible. And marriage is one of the most common testing grounds of faith. Sure, single people, it'd be easier to live alone. Never having to apologize. Wouldn't that be great? Cody, isn't that great? It is good. Never having to back down. Never having to defer to somebody else. But a disciple in that situation unless you're called to be a eunuch, will never become more like their Messiah. He or she will never learn fully to be a servant. He or she will never fully learn humility. He or she will never fully learn to sacrifice. Now, marital tests and trials, my friends, are to our advantage only if we pass them successfully, right? 
He or she passes the test of letting marriage's difficulties refine their character to be more like Messiah and by obtaining the price, the prize. Here's the prize. The prize is a peaceful home. Marriage and sexual union reunites the, the Adam, the earthling, to its original wholeness. Now both Ish and Isha from Adam fit together. They're sexually complementary. Don't let anybody fool you. Don't let the media fool you. The halves of humanity join together. The two genders were meant... There's not 47 genders, folks. I don't care what Facebook says. The two genders were meant to complete each other physically, emotionally, and in every other way. Look back at verse 20 to the words, Helper fit for him. Ezer kenegdo. Kenegdo. Ezer does not mean inferiority. Ezer does not mean subordination. In light of Genesis 1.27, the woman was created as man's equal. Helper doesn't mean inferior. And a wife is not just man's helper. Domestic servants would be better suited for that job and they'd be less expensive, honestly. <laughs> no, the helper supplies what is lacking and is a counterpart. And so both genders are needed for a healthy home. As Dr. James Dobson notes, quote, more than 10,000 studies have concluded that kids do best when they are raised by mothers and fathers. In the history of Israel found in the Tanakh, there's always been a clear distinction between the role of the husband and the role of the wife in the marital union. Hebrew males included being a loving leader, included being head of the family, included being a provider for the family. Likewise, the Hebrew women fulfilled her wifely responsibilities by being a bearer of his children, by managing the household, and by being a faithful companion to her man. But interestingly enough, in the New Covenant, our Messiah provided very little instruction on marriage. But what he did say about it is important and instructive for us. Yeshua assumed the role of the validity of the divine pattern for marriage set forth in these opening chapters in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. In addition, the Shaliach Peter, Kepha, has some very specific commands about the marriage relationship as well. You'll find in both the Tanakh and in the New Covenant, one man and one woman in a marriage covenant relationship for life. That is the divine pattern. It's amazing I even have to preach about these things, but we live in a generation where these are not just foundation building blocks for most of society. A covenant marriage is, quote, a sacred bond between a man and a woman instituted by and publicly entered into before God, normally consummated by sexual intercourse. Marriage is a creation ordinance with covenantal features, and marriage is a covenant Marriage as a covenant is the only view of marriage that portrays the Messiah's loving headship and the body of the Messiah's willing submission. You see, when a marriage follows the design of God, it's good for everybody, isn't it? It's good for men, it's good for women, it's good for children, it's good for the community, it's good for the country, good for the world, it's good for your pets. I mean, it's good for everything. God's way works. Every civilization in history is built upon the institution of marriage. It is the foundation, the happiness of couples, the welfare of the children, the propagation of this faith, the well-being of our society, the orderliness of civilization are all dependent upon the stability of marriage according to God's divine pattern. When the God-given pattern is undermined, as we see in this generation, the whole superstructure of our society becomes unstable. And so as we read about marriage from this opening parasha this week and find commentary to it in the New Covenant, perhaps the key commentary is found by Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, which we can really boil down to a formula. And here's the formula. Capital M before small m. Dr. Jim Garlow, i got to give him credit for this. It's incredible. Capital M before small m. God's plan for capital M marriage before small case marriage. In other words, the plan for Yeshua and the Kehillah, Yeshua and the Ecclesia, Yeshua body marriage, 
came way before earthly husband-wife marriage. It's like God is saying in this chapter, I want people to understand the exciting culmination of history. I'll create marriage on earth to model that exciting event. We tend to think that God somehow borrowed this metaphor of earthly marriage, right? No, the marriage of Yeshua and the body was first. Earthly marriage came second. The key is in verse 32 of Ephesians 5 where Paul says, quote, This mystery is great, but I'm talking about Messiah and his community. You see, we think God chose earthly marriage, the closest and happiest union, and he used it. But instead, no, God established the capital M marriage and then made millions of micro models, small case M marriages. You see, if I were the adversary, what would I do? I'd create strife. I would create dysfunction. I would create conflict. I'd create adultery. I'd throw in a little pornography and widespread divorce. That way people have no idea what the great crescendo of human history will really be like. That's what I would do, and that's what he's done. People get hung up on this issue. Oh, there's no marriage in heaven. My friends, why? Because heaven is marriage. That's the consummation. It is the marriage of Yeshua and the Kehillah. God wants you to have a great marriage here. Why? So that you really know how really great it's going to be there. God entrusted to earthly marriages something important and amazing to give a picture of the marriage. You see, the Messiah, as what many call the second Adam, Provides humanity with a fresh start. In Messiah, the human race can go back to Eden, so to speak, and start over in perfect righteousness and in perfect innocence. How does that work? Well, Adam's name means man. Sin and death came to humanity as a result of one man's sin. We are all guilty of our own sins and punished for our own misdeeds, but disobedience first entered the world through our father and our mother, the first father, the first mother, and through one single act of their disobedience, Adam forfeits his right to the tree of life, so human death comes through him. Death came, quote, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam. Romans 5, 14, which is to say that everybody dies whether they sin or not. An unborn child who dies, God forbid that happen. Though he or she has never had the opportunity to commit a single sin, dies all the same. It does seem frightfully unfair, doesn't it, that one man's single transgression would consign all humanity to death. But it's equally unfair that one man's righteousness also offered, offers all of us as humans the reward of righteousness. Quote, the right to the tree of life. Those who cast allegiance with him, the last Adam, the life-giving spirit, received that reward. As human beings, we are all sons of Adam, and we share in Adam's physical nature, including the fallen aspects of that nature. We share in his condemnation. The Messiah, Yeshua, is also a son of Adam, isn't he? He shared in Adam's nature as it was prior to his disobedience prior to his expulsion out of Ghani Don. Yeshua is in the form of the original man. He referred to himself as the son of man. That is the son of Adam. He's the second Adam. But unlike the first Adam, he did not transgress. And if the first Adam's sin was sufficient to merit death for all mankind for eons of time, the righteousness of the Messiah Yeshua, the last Adam, is sufficient to merit life For all of us through the eons of time. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive. And this life is not only a spiritual idea, my friends. This is the hope of eternal life through the resurrection of the dead. My friends, the Messiah Yeshua's resurrection reverses Adam's destruction. That's in those verses here. John, if you'd come back with uh, Dad, if you'd come back, and Craig as well, we're going to lift up the scroll. And 
one of you guys can support the other guy's arm because it's a little heavy on one side today, as it is every year on this service. All right, hold up his arms, Craig is, all right, I'm going to un unroll it a little bit, okay. And if you'd stand with me, with them. I'd love somebody to take a picture of this. <laughs> and this is the Torah given by Moses to the children of Israel at the command of the Lord in the hand of Moses. The Zota Torah, Asher Sam Moshe, B'nai Yisrael Alpi Adonai B'yad Moshe. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are those who uphold her. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all of her paths are peace. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we shall be restored. Renew our lives as in days of old. And you guys can pull that down gently and wrap her back on up. And let's sing that together, those words. It's Chahayim <laughs> He. Lamachazikim ba vetoho machea mehu shar dracheha darche no am vecho nativo tea shalom. Ashivenu Adonai Elecha vena shuva Chadesh Chadesh yamenu Chadesh yamenu and if we can get our children back here, if we had any today, I see a few in the, in the halls there. We encourage you to bring your children for Shabbat school every week. We've got a dynamite Shabbat school. And as we do every Shabbat, usually before they head off to their classes, I wanted to do a little different again this service where we bless our children traditionally on Simcha Torah. So if our children would come forward. Yeah, they're running out. Okay. <laughs> it's hard corralling them. They're running, running around. Yeah. And so, blessing the children goes back to ancient times in Israel. Fathers would bless their children. And in that generation, the children eagerly sought the blessings of dad. Remember Jacob and Esau? They, they, they understood it. The Shema and the Vyahavta are recited, that we recited earlier instructs us, saying, and you shall teach them the commandments. Teach them diligently to your children. Listen, maybe this whole thing in California about mandating the vaccine allows parents again to return back to doing just that. It's possible. Could be headed in a good direction in that regard. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk along the way, and when you lie down, and when you get up. According to Yeshua, the portion of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 contains the most important command in all of Scripture. My friends, we as parents are called by God to teach our children the Scriptures. The public schools are not going to do that. Maybe the private schools won't do that. The charter schools won't do that. Well, if you have an opportunity to homeschool, you'll do that. It's not even the primary job of the congregation, although, of course, we do supplement the home. Matthew chapter 19, Yeshua had some interesting words for these young ones and for those onlookers at that day. He said this.
Then little children were brought to Yeshua so that he might lay hands upon them and pray. And then the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But Yeshua said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying his hands upon them, he went on from there. So we as adults, and a number of you are parents of these young kids, I know it's challenging. We can somehow have attitudes with our children. And this attitude here in the scriptures, children should be seen and not heard, must have been this attitude that Yeshua's disciples had. They didn't want the rabbi disturbed by these immature young people. Unfortunately, fortunately, fortunately, Yeshua had a better attitude than his disciples. So we want to bless our children this morning. For our sons, this blessing is taken from Jacob's blessing over Manasseh and Ephraim. Yisimcha Adonai. May God make each one of you boys like Ephraim and Manasseh as you build up the house of Israel in your generation. And for the daughters, the blessing is Yisimech Elohim, Kesara, Rivka, Rachel, Valea. May God make each one of you girls sculptured in palace style like Rachel, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah. We recite God's blessing over your lives, kids, today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up his countenance over you and give you peace. In the name of Prince of all peace, Yeshua. And may God bless your socks off today in his name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs>
Again, may Adonai bless you and keep you as you leave today. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance over you and give you his peace that passes all understanding in Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. being with one another in the Lord's presence today. God bless you on the rest of the Shabbat. We'll meet outside in the foyer for Kiddush and for some fellowship. Get to know somebody you've never maybe met today and uh, just wish my hearty Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Good Shabbos, everybody. Shabbat Shalom.